Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to another double weekly wrap up. I have fallen into the habit of doing these fortnightly rather than weekly because my Hugo and Nebula award winners project is throwing a kink in my usual schedule, but it's all right. Uh, in the last two weeks, I read at least eight books. Yeah, eight books and three magazine issues, maybe more than that. Um, I'm only gonna talk about five books because the other three were Hugo and Nebula award winners and they will be included in my October wrap up of all of those various books. Let's start with the very beautiful but very strange book that I read. This is The Chemical Wedding by Christian Rosenkreutz, A Romance in Eight Days by Johann Valentin André, in a new version by John Crowley. And if that's not confusing, I don't know what is. I didn't know what this book was at all until I got it and I started reading it. I backed Small Beer Press's um, Kickstarter to make this edition because it's just absolutely beautiful. You can see the title page there. It's just a gorgeous physical object. What it is, is a book published in 1616 in Germany. It was originally anonymous. The title was The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreuz. Turns out it was written by Johann André, who claimed it eventually. And this particular edition is annotated and kind of tweaked by John Crowley. Crowley is also arguing that this is the first science fiction novel predating Somnium. I personally was not super convinced by his argument, but I thought it was very interesting to consider and he points out some things in the text that make him think it is science fictional. It's a pretty simple story to sum up. An old alchemist is invited to a royal wedding and when he goes there, some royal people get their heads cut off and then their bodies are reduced to liquid and various things have formed into little homunculi which are then fed and grow up to become the next king and queen. It's bizarre. Some people think that this is an alchemical like fable in that alchemists apparently because they kept their recipes and their experiments so secret they would write stories to explain their recipes so like characters and symbols would stand in for the ingredients and the process and such. So some people think that this is that and the other thing, people think that it's like a religious text or something. All I can say is it's just strange and nobody seems to agree and there are some really outlandish, convoluted explanations for the, the symbolism and the actions in this. It was just really fun to read. I read it an entire evening and was just highly amused by it. At least in this edition, it's translated in a very readable and almost colloquial style, so I never felt like I was reading something that was really old. It was just weird. Next I read Life After Life by Kate Atkinson. This book was really popular a couple of years ago when it first came out. I remember a lot of people reading and talking about it and I thought it was speculative fiction but now I would call this historical fiction with a twist. It follows Ursula Todd who was born on a stormy night in 1910 and she promptly dies strangled by her umbilical cord and then she is born again and she lives longer and then she dies and then she's reborn in this endless cycle. Her life is a little bit different every time. She lives a bit longer. Sometimes she dies very young, sometimes she dies when she's older, and the end goal is that she is supposed to eventually meet and kill Hitler, which is not a spoiler, it's the very first scene in the book. This book really didn't do it for me. I thought I was going to DNF it quite quickly because I was getting very bored by how repetitive it was, but it finally started moving on to later portions of her life when she was living a bit longer and being an adult and doing different things. It's very much about what a woman's life was like, the pretty narrow range of possibilities that a woman like Ursula Todd could choose to do in the world and how slowly I think her life opened up a bit more as time went on. You got through World War I and World War II and such. And I just thought that that historical fiction aspect was quite interesting and it was good that it wasn't really so much about her in places. It would follow other characters in her life a little bit and a little bit of their points of view. So there was some variation because Ursula herself was kind of a wet blanket. She's supposed to be the central character, but she really doesn't have any agency. And this is what I didn't like about the book. Ursula does not know she's being reborn. She's not consciously trying to make different decisions to avoid various ways that she dies. It's just accidental. 
Sometimes she has deja vu. Sometimes she's struck with absolute terror at a point where she had died in a previous life, but she does not know what's going on. So in speculative fiction, I would expect there to be more of a system. There should be more rules and there sh that this constant rebirth cycle would have more of a point. She just dies and she's reborn and you repeat the whole thing and it doesn't really matter. And then there were some bits in the middle and then near the end that I was really getting into these individual stories of her life. And then when it ended and I realized that actually this is not the end and Ursula shouldn't really be that special because Every time she's reborn, isn't everybody else? I mean, they're different too every time. It's not just her. What's the point of all this? It probably just wasn't really my thing. <laughs> Next, I read All the Little Liars by Charlene Harris, and this was a real surprise because it's the ninth Aurora Tea Garden mystery, and that series wrapped up a long time ago. But from what I gather, there was a TV movie version made, and then it was received well, so Harris is gonna write a couple more books. But the thing is, I actually really liked the story. I have been very disappointed by the last five or six books by Harris, so it's a bit of a mystery in and of itself why I'm still reading her books. Actually, it's not a mystery. She's the one and only author I've ever signed up to be put on hold automatically for her books at the library. I'm just too lazy to cancel my Bestsellers Club membership for that, so... Anyway, Aurora is a librarian in a small southern town and she occasionally gets involved in local murder mysteries and investigations. All the Little Liars picks up right after the end of the eighth book. Aurora has just married her second husband. She's just found out that she's pregnant and her younger teenage half-brother Philip has come to live with her because of events that I don't remember very well. And the mystery is quite straightforward. Philip and two of his teenage friends disappear and then they find out that an 11 year old girl and another teenage boy have also disappeared probably with them and they don't know how or why such a large group of teenagers could have run away or been kidnapped or been coerced in some way without anybody knowing about it. So Aurora and the local police are trying to find out what happened. I don't think there's much more to say about the mystery than that. This is a very short book. It's only barely over 200 pages long and I thought it read a little bit like a novella. I was really happy while reading this book. There are just things that I haven't enjoyed so much about Harris's previous books and the fact that she always seems to wrap up her series by giving her female lead a husband and a baby and it's just... I don't know. So when the first part of the book was all about Aurora with her new husband and thinking about having a baby and everything, I wasn't so sure I was gonna like it. But when it finally got into Aurora's relationship with her brother Philip and the concern of all the adults, and then there's this element of school bullying and cyber bullying, and then one of the teenage characters uh, who's missing is gay, and that's also talked about, it got much more interesting and realistic and well done than I really expected from one of Harris's mysteries. I feel bad saying that, but I have been burned by a couple of her recent five or six books. <laughs> so I would actually recommend this one. Aurora is a great character and a lot of the side characters are also very interesting. I just think that the Aurora Tea Garden mystery series is one of the best that Harris has ever written much better than some of her more recent work. The last two books that I have to talk about are young adult novels, which is interesting because I don't read that much new young adult these days, but I picked up both of these books because Brie from Stories from the Shelf read and reviewed them and had great things to say about them, and I was like, I should try those. The first one is Labyrinth Lost by Zoraida Cordova, which is about a teenage girl who is a bruja, and when her powers come in and she has her death day, she accidentally banishes her family to hell while trying to perform a spell that will reject her powers because she doesn't want them. So, oops, she has to go on a journey through Los Lagos to get her family back. The plot itself is a very stereotypical coming-of-age journey where your character makes a mistake, goes on a journey to fix that mistake, and then, hey, we're done. It was just very predictable because of that. There are some things that I really liked about it though. Um, the culture, for one. This is based on like Latino culture. The main character is Latina. She comes from a family of brujas and brujos. And that 
community and, and how that magic system works and everything. I have never read something like it in a fantasy novel before. It was just completely refreshing and I really, really enjoyed that. It's also unusual that the main character is bisexual and her love triangle is her interest in a girl and then her interest in a boy, which I've also never read in a young adult novel and I thought that part was done quite well. However, didn't think we needed a love triangle in the story at all. I mean, the point is that her family is dead and she has to bring them back. And yet she spends a lot of time staring at people's muscles and hair and nose rings and... <sighs> I would be terrified out of my mind that I was going to be an orphan the rest of my life, but she wants to kiss somebody. Anyway, however, I just can't come up with many other really, really positive aspects of this book because the main character was a bit whiny and just dumb. She makes some stupid mistakes. She doesn't seem to be thinking through her problem at all. Nevertheless, I think this series, because it is going to be a series, has a lot of potential and I will definitely pick up the next book whenever it comes out to see if any of these problems are fixed because now that we've gotten past the setup, more original stories might come and more characters and maybe we'll have more character growth that makes me like the main character more. Also, I've completely forgotten her name and I feel really bad about that. Oops. <laughs> The other book I read because of Brie is On the Edge of Gone by Corinne Dalvis. I wanted to read this book for the last six months and I finally got my hands on the library copy. I'm so glad because I really enjoyed this book. I devoured almost the last three-fourths of it in an entire day because it was just that good and so readable and engaging. This is about, well, a comet is going to hit the Earth. They know exactly when it's going to hit. Many people are trying to leave on generation ships to go colonize these twin planets that they believe will support life. And everybody else is left to try to ride out the comet, the impact, and all the disaster after that in shelters deep underground. Our main character is a teenage girl named Denise and her mother. They are on their way to their assigned shelter when they come across a woman and her wife who has been injured. They help them get to their shelter, which turns out to be a generation ship that hasn't left yet. And then Denise and her mother try to convince the captain of the ship that they should be allowed on board. The twist, the problem here, is that the ship is only accepting people who have skills that they need, who will be very useful to them. And and Denise is autistic and her mother is a drug addict. So there's this big question of what do people have to contribute? What does an autistic person have to contribute? Should you save people who will be a, a drag on your society like her mother might be. So Denise is trying to prove herself. She's trying to find her older sister who was supposed to meet them but has gone missing. And she's trying to find a way to get her mother on board as well. I just all around enjoyed this book. I loved being in Denise's head and seeing this authentic portrayal of an autistic person's life because the author Dalvis is also autistic. I really trust that this is, this is real. This is what it's really like. Not every person's experience, but one person's experience. There are a couple of other little things about this that I really liked. Um, Denise kind of proves herself. Her skill is information organizing and the work that she does on the ship when she's helping out is literally a technical communication job. This is what I do. So I was very happy that it seems like my skill set might still be useful and appreciated and valued <laughs> should the world be about to end. So all around, I recommend this as a YA science fiction novel that I was very impressed by. And I also think that it's going to have a sequel come out eventually, and I will definitely read that. Those are the five books that I'm gonna talk about in this video. My next one will be my wrap up of the eight or so Hugo and Nebula award winners I read in October, which hopefully I have the stamina to film that right after this. We will see. Thank you guys so much for watching and I hope you have a lovely weekend, happy reading, and I will talk to you again in my next video. Bye.